Welcome, so great to have you here at church today. And again, if this is your very first time, so glad that you could be with us at Bright Church. If you're joining us online, so glad that you could be tuning in from anywhere, like for example, Thailand. So just why don't we give our guys in Thailand a big shout out this morning. Come on. We're praying for you, believing for you guys, doing great things over there. I know that Pastor Nick has got to get up. He's going to speak today, and I'm believing for good things to happen over there too. It's a good week. Uh, it's actually in the next week. It is my birthday, and I am turning 43, and I hear you. I hear you, but you look so young is what you're thinking about me. Um, how can you even be over 40? I get that. I hear it, and thank you. But uh, yeah, I'm turning. Uh, 43. And I'll tell you something that's true. I don't feel like I am 43. And I've noticed a phenomena uh, that happens with people as they get older, me included, is that you never feel like you're getting older. I, I feel like internally, uh, I'm still somewhere in my 20s. It's a bit of a problem because uh, internally and externally, those things don't actually match all the time. Uh, and there have been times in my life where I think I could do something that I couldn't. I have overestimated my capacity. I've overestimated my ability. And uh, I remember doing this even when I was younger. I probably underestimated or overestimated my, my physical strength. Uh, I remember the very first time that I went to a gym. I don't know if you've ever been to a gym, but the very first time you walk in, it's a little jarring. You don't know what to do, where to go. And I remember seeing a bench press that was set up. It had maybe 40 kilos on it. So with the bar, we're talking 60 kilos. And I remember looking at and assessing it visually and thinking, that's fine for me. I've never done bench press before. I remember getting that weight off and immediately being crushed by it. It was one of those embarrassing situations where you're sort of sliding and the weights are sliding off one end and then the other. And um, it was a bad experience for me. But I just kind of overestimated my ability to do what I wanted to do. I have done this many times in my life. 2019, I remember I was uh, over in Canada. I was skiing. My brother is an outstanding skier. And I remember we were standing on the slopes and I said, come on, man, let's have a race. And he said, all right. So I took off and he even gave me a head start. And after a little while, I'm like going as fast as I can. But after a little while, just a little while, he just caught me, overtook me. And he skied up on the side of the run and I had to catch up to him. As I was catching up to him, I thought, nah, I'm going to blow right past him. Let's see if I can beat him again. So as I'm going up, I'm starting to slow up. And I get over the edge and it's kind of a sharp drop off and it goes into a bit of a ditch. Long story short, I went down that ditch. I uh, overestimated my skill set in that moment, wasn't able to stop in time. I actually fell down and broke one of my ribs every time that I breathed in for the next uh, maybe two to three weeks. It felt like someone was sort of stabbing me in the, in the ribs. So that wasn't good. Just... Uh, overestimated my capacity and I thought, but that's okay, I'm mature now, right? So I won't do that again. Well, recently I took up park run and I thought to myself, I am 42 years old. I can go from not doing anything running wise for years and years into running 5Ks multiple times a week. Well, after I started doing that, man, my legs started to get a pain that I have never experienced before. I remember speaking to a running coach and he looked at me. I knew what he was thinking. I was thinking the same thing. He's like, you can't just do that, you know? You're 42. And when you hear that, you're like, only on the outside, mate, not on the inside, because you don't ever feel like you're that old. Now, the reason why I couldn't do what I wanted to do was not because I didn't want to do it. I mean, I, I, I wanted to do those things. I just lacked the ability to do it. Now, the thing that I'm talking about today, I think that this is a spiritual issue in the church. I think what I'm talking about is a spiritual issue where you want to do something that you can't do. And if you want to do something, but you can't do it, you're trying really hard in an area maybe to stop something that somewhere along the line you started doing and you're struggling with that, you are in good company. And the reason is, is because the Apostle Paul and thousands, millions and millions of Christian people have experienced the exact same thing. And I want to read to you from Romans chapter 7, verse 18. The title of my message today is, Help, I Can't Stop Sinning. 
Romans chapter 7, verse 18. It says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. In the New Testament, the word for flesh is the word sarx. It means human nature. So my human nature, there's nothing that's good in here, Paul is saying. He says, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Do you notice that? I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I have the desire. I want to do what's right. I just don't seem to be able to do it. I wonder how many Christian people have found themselves in that exact situation, even though they love God. They want to do the right thing. They just lack the ability to be able to do it. He says in verse 19, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. He doesn't want to do it, but he's doing it anyway. Verse 20, Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And it almost looks like Paul is saying it's not my fault. He's actually not saying that at all. He's saying that sin has the power to enslave people. And by the way, sin is my problem. He's being really clear about that. So he is responsible for his sins, but because he's responsible and he does keep doing them, and maybe some of them he was even choosing to do, it puts him into a position of slavery and now he's caught in a cycle. And that's what he's saying. He's, he's a slave to it. Verse 21, he says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I grew up on a very steep hill, uh, our, our childhood home. Uh, the driveway was flat. We used to play, you know, any kind of ball sport that we could in, in the driveway. And we would always do everything we can. We even set up barricades to stop the ball from going out the driveway. Because the moment that it went out, it was running down the hill. And you had like seconds to get to that thing. But because it was so steep, the moment any kind of ball goes out that street... You can run, but you will not catch it. It will get away from you. You're just done. And sin can be like that for us. You know, like once it gets away from you, it gathers momentum and it feels like, oh, I will never get this back. I don't know how to stop it. How can I do it? And, and it's, not, it's not that you don't want to stop. It's just that you can't stop from doing it. It's almost like, it's almost like if you lie to yourself and you say, hey, I'm going to open that box of chicken crimpy shapes and I'll just have a couple and then, and then I will put the box back, right? You are lying to yourself, right? Because it is almost impossible to do that. Do you know what? Is it just me? Am I just uh, putting this out there and it's just me or do you guys know what I'm talking about? No, so, okay, you're not convinced, right? Uh, you, need to have a, you need to have some shapes right now. So I'm going to get the team to hand out some shapes to you right now. And as you grab these shapes, I want you to, oh, I would like for you to open the packet. And if you can, just sit with them on your lap and try not to finish them. What you will find is that your hand has a brain of its own. Your hand will feed your mouth without your actual brain even being connected to it. And the only time you will realize this is happening is when you reach for one more and the packet is empty. You don't remember eating one. That is how this thing works. It's like it's happening. You don't want it to happen. Remember, guys, fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So let's see if you've got some self-control today. I don't know how you go. But what happens when we are doing what we don't want to do and when we repeat it, when we repeatedly do what we don't want to do, we become a slave to that thing. Paul talks often about slavery in the Bible. And, you know, we don't, we don't talk much about slavery in a general sense. Um, but slavery is a probably an important thing to understand. We'd probably use a different word for it today. But let me say this. When it comes to slavery, anybody that's a slave to anything means they don't have freedom. Could we say that? Slaves don't have freedom. They want to be free. If you ask them, hey, don't you want to be out of here? They would say, oh, absolutely. I don't want to, I, I don't want to be stuck in here. But they're slaves, which means that they can't break free. They're just stuck in that situation. And that's exactly what Paul talks about when he talks about being a slave. So we wouldn't use that word today. But the, I feel like the word that we would use most regularly is probably the word addiction. 
So we don't often say someone's a slave to sin. That's, that's a thing that you don't hear very often. We would say someone's addicted to a certain behavior. And they don't want to be addicted to that behavior, but they happen to be addicted to it, whatever it is. And when somebody is experiencing a level of addiction and a cycle of sin, perhaps, that they can't break free of, it affects every part of them. And I would tell you that it absolutely affects you as an individual. You, you, if you've got an addiction in your life, you probably have little weird things that you do that people might notice but disregard because you're not really overt about the thing that you're struggling with, but it absolutely affects you. It absolutely affects your behavior. If you've got an addiction in your life, it's affecting your behavior, whether you realize it or not. It's just there. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. If, um, you know, let's say you're a parent and one of your kids comes up and, and, and says, hey, can I just grab your phone for a second? And you're like, no, nobody has my phone. If you're overprotective of your phone, there might be a reason for that. And maybe the reason why you don't want anyone else to have your phone or the passcode to your phone is because you know that if they go into the wrong thing, they might see what's been on your mind. And because of that, you're super protective. You know, if you, if you start being really protective with your phone as a spouse, your spouse will notice that behavior. And if you think, oh, this is, nobody knows and it's a total secret. No, it's there. They see it. Sometimes people choose to not, to, they don't want to believe something about their spouse. So maybe they just ignore it. But no, it's there. It's there. Maybe uh, it, it should be something that you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe it's something different. Maybe it's gambling. You know, you, you've got a gambling addiction, you know, and you thought that, you know, yesterday was going to be an amazing day because you were going to, uh, you know, make tons of money on the game that you were watching. You just didn't see it going that way. And now you're absolutely devastated because you're not in the position that you thought you'd be in. What I'm saying to you is that if you've got an addiction in your life that you've become a slave to, Try as hard as you want. Sometimes what you find is that you just repeat the cycle over and over. So what does this mean? It means it affects your relationships. And you can say to yourself, oh, no, 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 I've got this thing under control. Believe me, it's affecting your relationships more than you realize. And to this, the Apostle Paul says, here's the really sad part about all of this. Here's the sad part. You know what to do. That's the sad part. You know what to do. And the thing that you're meant to do is to just stop doing what you're doing. Simple, right? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Do you know what I find is in the scriptures, most of the things that we're meant to do are really simple. We don't want to overcomplicate this more than is necessary. It's really simple to do a lot of the things that the Bible says. It's simple, but I've discovered that the simple things are actually really hard. Just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's not hard. It can be really challenging to do the most simple things. It's like, for example, I, I understand that if you're uh, a person, let's say, for example, if you, you, you want to get something ready, you want to get fit, you're going to go to the beach at some point. So you're saying, okay, it's time to break free of winter. I want to lose a few pounds. And so in your mind, you go, okay, is that simple? Yeah, it's pretty simple, I guess. Like, I realize that some people might have a medical uh, reason that this doesn't work for them. But for the most part, if you put yourself in a calorie deficit and walk 10,000 steps a day, you're going to lose weight. And is that a really simple thing to do? Yeah. It, would that work for most of the population? Yeah, absolutely. Is it an easy thing to do? No, it's hard. It's simple, but it's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, like the simple things are really hard. Yeah. Uh, what about fasting? How simple can it? It can't get simpler than that. How do I do it? All right, you don't eat. And, and then you pray. And why is it that every time you decide to fast, somebody has a birthday at your work and they bring out a cake and you were like, oh, this is so hard. It's simple though, right? What, what, what are you meant to do? You just don't eat the cake. Simple. Really? You're well, simple and hard. So, so simple and hard, they can go together. All right. So sometimes things are really simple, but they're really hard. And this is the way that we think about it. We think, well, if I just 
I, I know what to do and, and I will just not do it. You know, I, I typically find that when people have made a mistake and they feel very bad about it, they feel very guilty about it, they, they go, well, I won't do that ever again. And their willpower is an 11 out of 10. And they think, I will maintain this level of intensity when it comes to my willpower. I will maintain this for the rest of my life. And then as long as I maintain this level of intensity when it comes to my willpower, I will never do that thing again. But can I tell you something about your willpower that might be surprising to you? Even though we understand self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Yes, that's true in in, in a spiritual sense. Do you know that your willpower goes up and down? So you don't have the same willpower 24 7 You don't have the same willpower. People have done studies on this. They've researched it. And what they've discovered is your willpower will go up and down based on a couple of things. Listen to this. The prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain linked to self-control, performs less well under stress, fatigue, and low blood sugar levels. What does that mean? Well, it means that when you're stressed you don't have the same level of willpower as when you're relaxed. So if you're going through a very stressful time at work and you're looking for a mental escape, that's a dangerous combination because you are very stressed and you desperately don't want to feel it. And in that space, your willpower, statistically speaking, is actually quite low. So let me make this really simple for you. And I hope this is helpful to you because if you can recognize the signs, you should be able to, in future, safeguard yourself against doing dumb things. Okay? All right. When you're tired, you're more likely to sin. When you're tired, you're more likely to sin. You're more likely to sin because you're exhausted and your willpower is down and you feel stressed. And because of that, you're more prone to just being able to give way to the one thing that you really want, which is sometimes just to escape from where you are, even though you what? Know what to do. Even though you know what to do. You you know not to do that thing, but now you're tired. And it's so much easier to do that. And then what happens? You make a mistake and your willpower goes up to about an 11. You're filled with a sense of guilt or shame or something. Your willpower goes up and then you go, okay, this time I will never do that again and I will maintain a willpower of 11 out of 10. Then you have a stressful, you see the problem. And it just sort of goes around and around. By the way, how do we know what to do? Well, for us, uh, we're, we're blessed in this age, but even thousands of years ago, when God took Israel out of Egypt, he gave them the Ten Commandments and he gave them the law. And there are parts of the law, civil and ceremonial, that we don't really adhere to anymore, but God's moral law still applies and we still follow many of the things that he said today. We don't do all of it, but we do some of it, just the moral part. So when uh, Jesus came from heaven to earth around the time that where Paul the Apostle actually wrote this very scripture, he at least growing up had the Torah, the law. And so he would pay attention to that. But in this day and age, we even have what we might call the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What is that? Well, it means that the Spirit of God will speak to you and he'll say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Or maybe you should be doing that. And he convicts you of what's right or what's wrong. And what happens when you're convicted is that you get the opportunity to respond out of that. Does this make sense? Is this making sense to you? Okay. So, so what happens is, is the Spirit of God will speak to your spirit and your conscience carries that message to your soul, which will actually do something with the information. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 1. He said, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God speaks to me. I sense it. 
Uh, he, he bears witness with my spirit. My conscience informs my soul, which is my mind, my will, my intellect. And once I've got that, I'm either going to choose to obey it or I'm going to choose to ignore it. And it's interesting because many things can happen to your soul. The Bible speaks about him. You can have a guilty conscience. You can have a clear conscience. You can have a conscience that is cleansed. You can have a conscience that is corrupted. And the apostle Paul wrote a letter to Timothy and he said, liars, liars. Okay, so not just someone that has lied and said, oh, I'm sorry, and I shouldn't have. He says, you know, people that just lie, they just lie all the time. He said, these people have actually had their consciences seared. And the searing of a conscience is a horrible thing when it happens. The searing of a conscience, the word that they even use, it actually means like when you sear meat. And when you sear it, it's like nothing is supposed to go in and nothing goes out. It's been seared. It actually means to make it, in a sense, numb. Or a better way to understand it is it makes it unresponsive. So when your conscience stops working, that's a very dangerous place to be. Because when your conscience stops working, you find it easier to perhaps walk in territory that previously you would have never dreamed possible. I'll never do that. Oh, yeah, but that was before your conscience was actually seared. I remember somebody said this to me a long time ago, and it just kind of stuck with me because, you know, this is the church. We are not a group of people that are perfect, but we are people that are called by the grace of God that put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Like, you know, no perfect people allowed. The only but perfect person is Jesus. I think hopefully we should understand that. So, so and now understanding that all of us have a measure of brokenness for which we go to God for grace for, we, I, I heard somebody say this. They said, you're allowed to come to church and struggle. They said, you're not allowed to come to church and not struggle. Do you get that? You're allowed to come and struggle. You're just, you're just not allowed to come and not struggle anymore. In other words, you just give permission to yourself to live any way that you want. You sit under preaching and teaching of the word. You read the scriptures. And despite the fact that it says, yeah, stay away from this or do that, you see that, hear that, acknowledge that, but create different rules for yourself. You say, oh, it's okay for me. That's not really a big deal. Do you know what I've discovered about, you know, the phrase, that's not really a big deal? That's not really a big deal will move in increments in your life. And it takes you way past where you ever thought you'd go. I remember when I was a kid growing up and I, I asked my mum this question one day. Um, I, I said, I was hanging out with a group of friends and many of them were people that didn't really necessarily have a revelation of who God was. And as they were talking and saying certain things, I remember coming home, I was still in primary school, I was quite young, and I, I said, Mum, why do I feel bad about these things? And other people don't. And my mom said something really simple. She said, well, perhaps it's because God is speaking to you about what you should and shouldn't do. And I thought, that's what it is. What it is for me is that God is speaking to me, but he's not speaking to them the same way that he's speaking to me. And when you're a person who gives your life to Jesus, what happens? Well, you go through a process of renewal. Your spirit comes alive. And when the spirit bears witness with your spirit and communicates to you what you should do, what you shouldn't do, it informs your conscience, which tells your soul. And I found myself going, wow, I probably shouldn't be doing this and I probably shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, but then what did I do after that? Well, I followed that up with about 12 years of searing my conscience. And what I thought would have been terrible at the beginning of that journey, by the end of that journey was so far from where I ever thought I would be. And you think, how does that happen to people? How, how does that happen? Well, it happens in increments. It happens Little step by little step by little step. 
And you watch people that you love take little step and little step, searing their conscience all the way. This is why you got to pay attention to your conscience. you got to pay attention to your conscience. Because if you keep ignoring everything your conscience says and you keep searing it, it just that's not important. That's not a big deal. God doesn't really care about that. One day you'll wake up and you'll be so far from where you ever wanted to be. And the whole time you were walking away, you had no idea. How is that possible? Possible? Oh, you ignored your conscience all the way there. Not a great place to be. This is why I say you don't, don't ignore your conscience. It might be the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I'll tell you that the Spirit of God will speak to you, but there's lots of voices that will speak to you. You're probably one of those voices. You might not be always the best person to listen to. Listen to God over yourself. But then what I've typically found to be true is that even people... Um, that, that love God, that are doing everything they can, that they will still have the voice of the enemy, the devil who come and speak straight into their life as well. And the enemy of your soul, he will come in and he'll do everything that he can to condemn you for the things that you have done. So here's the play. He'll tell you it's not a big deal before you do it. Then you do it and he says you're the worst person ever. But why don't we just lift the lid on spiritual warfare right now? I mean, part of the reason why I'm preaching this message is because over the years, I can't, I, I, I couldn't even tell you the amount of people that I've spoken to that said, I, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. I think I've lost my salvation. And I'll say to them things like, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on. Are you, do you still feel like you shouldn't have done that? Do you feel repentant in your heart? Are you fighting against it? Are you struggling against it? They say, yes. And I say, well, you're probably okay. I mean, you're not exactly where you want to be. Sure, let's, let's not make light of sin, but let's make big of our Savior, Jesus Christ, because the fact that you're wrestling it is a great place to be. It's, it's where you see your conscience conscience and you say, hey, I don't even care about this anymore. Or oh, now you're in trouble. That's the worst place for you to be. You do not want to get to that place. So the devil loves to condemn you and he'll bring up things. Gosh, he's such an artist, isn't he? He's such an, he's a, paints with such accuracy and detail, vivid images of the things that you've done in your past. And it's like, he has this never ending, I've said this before, but like a Rolodex of things that you've done. He's like, oh, let's remember this from April 2011. Look at this card. Oh, do, hey, you remember when you did that? Gosh, you're a shockingly horrible, hypocritical, deceitful. You're a terrible person, right? He loves to bring that stuff up, even though that's stuff that you've taken to God and asked forgiveness for and repented of, but he, he brings it up again and again. And I, I remember saying this last time is that, you know, if you're born after the year 2000, don't don't think Rolodex. You don't even know what that is. Think YouTube shorts. You know, it, you're on YouTube and he just brings up these little shorts of your life with great detail, 4K resolution of the mistakes that you've made. And you think, man, I am. I, I, I'm doing so bad. I, I feel so terrible, right? That's his whole play to make you feel guilty. And it's such an effective tool because if you feel guilty, you don't want to go to God and the place that you need to be is right in the very presence of God, which is why he does it all in the first place. It makes sense. He will never, ever let you off the hook unless it's right before you're about to cross the line. He'll let you off the hook then because he'll say it's not a big deal till you cross it and then you are the worst person ever. And one of the things that the devil loves to do is attach your identity to what you've done. But Jesus never does that. Have you noticed how the Holy Spirit never does that? He never attaches your identity to what you've done. But actually, if your identity is going to be in anything, it shouldn't be in what you've done. It shouldn't be in your bank account. It shouldn't be in the car that you drove here today. Uh, let me tell you something. If you got it in this world, you can lose it in this world. The one thing that your identity is meant to be attached to is the very fact that you're a child of God. And if you're a child of God, it's made adopt it means that you're adopted. And if you're adopted, there's a reason for that. You know what it is? God loves you. And that's beautiful. And that's where our identity is meant to be. But the devil will never let you think that. He says, no, 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 you're always what you've done. To which Paul writes in Romans 7, 22. He says, for I delight in the law of God, which I thought was astonishing to me because the law looks pretty serious and there's lots of it. I wouldn't have delighted in it, but he did. He says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. In other words, my soul, oh, it just loves the good things of God. That's what he's saying. In my soul, I delight in the law of God. But I see in my members, which means his body. 
He says, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin. You see that? We're talking about slavery all over again. Maybe addiction all over again. I see another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And he says, this wretched man that I am. Wow. How many Christians do you know that have got to that point? To the same point that the Apostle Paul, guys, the Apostle Paul, he got to the same point, wretched man that I am, why can't I stop doing this? It's not like I want to keep doing this. I actually love you, God. I actually believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I love you with all of my heart. And even though I love you, I, am, I hate the fact that I'm struggling in this area of my life. Why can't I just break free of this sin? Why can't I break free? Wretched man that I am. He asked the question. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Can I tell you that everyone's fighting a battle you can't see? Honestly, I, after being a pastor for as many years as I have been, I think every single person that I meet has got something that's going on beneath the surface. It's not all sinful, but some of it is. They're fighting a battle that you can't see. It might be a faith thing that's going on. And there's a fear sometimes that I think creeps into people's hearts. And I just want I just, I just to out what the enemy is doing right now. Because I feel like today, if I can out him and expose him, that will make you wise to the devil's devices. Does it make sense? makes sense to me. The fear is if people ever knew what was going on in my life, they would reject me in a second. Not forgetting that you're surrounded by a bunch of people that are going through their own things in their own way. And the enemy loves to come and say, if they only ever knew what was really going on in your life, straight away they would reject you. And that fear of even exposure. Have, has the enemy ever come to you and just tried to say, I'm going to expose you? I tell, can I tell you something? That happened to me. I, I remember saying yes to the call of God in my life. And the devil came to me before I stepped into being a pastor. And he said, I'll tell everyone what you've done. And I'm like, yeah, great. I'll tell everyone what I've done. Um, and then I'll say how the grace of God came and saved me, restored me, redeemed me, healed me. And if God did it for me, He can do it for them. Like, like you want to... You want to tell them what I did? I'll tell them what I did, you know? And I'll tell them also about the grace of God. Do you see what I'm saying? He always wants to expose people because there's that fear of, oh, wow, what happens? I'll get rejected. So here's what most people do. They keep it in the dark. Keep it to themselves. And if they keep it in themselves and they keep it in the dark, you tell me what happens to their mental health. You tell me what happens to their emotional health. And you watch people take a downward spiral. And I've seen people that are called, gifted and graced by God just move backwards and backwards and backwards. And all on a lie. All on a lie. It's a downward spiral that takes people further and further from the presence of God. But I tell you, there is no good reason for that. Only The only reason is they lean in to listen to the enemy. And you know what the enemy will do? He'll come along and he'll say, Hey, you're supposed to be a Christian. And Christians are aren't supposed to struggle with the stuff that you struggle with. And if you really loved God, you would never struggle with any of these things. He'll say, you know what you are? You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite because you confess that Jesus is Lord and yet you continue to make mistakes in your life. And it's like, well, yeah, because you're not perfect. Now, I believe that God can come and do a work in your life. Absolutely. But don't start going down this way of thinking because that'll just make you feel guilty. And you know what happens? People spend their, the rest of their life walking in guilt instead of walking in their calling. And I'm like, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Is that the end for people? Wow. That they just walk in guilt for the rest of their life thinking, well, this is the way it is for me. I'll never be free of this. And the answer is no. If you are a Christian, let's say the obvious. Sin is 
bad for you. It's bad. It's, it's real bad. If you're a Christian, sin is bad for you. But it's not the end of you either. Yeah, is it bad for you? Absolutely. Would we say, oh, it's okay, it's not a big deal? No, 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 we wouldn't say that. It's bad for you, it's just, it's just not the end of you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, in the Old Testament, you would see that salvation came to the Jews. How? How did, before Jesus came, how did salvation come to them? Was it because of their perfection? No, I mean, gosh, just read the book. I mean, the thing that this teaches is over and over again is that they were never going to obey themselves because of their obedience. They were never going to obey. They were never going to get close to God based on their obedience. So then you go, well, well, how did they get close to God? Well, it wasn't because they could obey everything. It was primarily just because they loved Him. Like, honestly, when you take a step back and you look at it, it's because they loved Him. So the law comes along, which is good because Israel needed to know how to live. The law comes along. It's good. But the law is good. And then in another way, it's kind of bad. It's not bad. I mean, it's good. But the thing that makes it bad or the thing that makes it difficult is, is that as soon as you know what not to do, then immediately it can create in you a sense of wanting to do it. It's like handing to Israel a red button and saying, never push this. It's like, oh, but now that's all I want to do. I just want to push it, right? So, so for Israel, they, oh, wow, they, they didn't know what it was to covet until they learned, out, learned what coveting was. And then they go, well, now that's a problem for me. I didn't realize, right? You didn't realize, and now it's an issue, right? You see, do you see how the law, is, is it good? Absolutely, because it's about righteous living. But the moment it's introduced, it creates something worse inside of them in some way and condemns them. When Yahweh came to Israel, here's what He said. He goes, I offer you a covenant, which is an agreement. And the law, the law was their way of obeying, and obeying the law was their way of saying, we love you and we're choosing this agreement. That's what the law was all about. It demonstrated their loyalty to Him, not their perfection of the things that He said. Listen, I don't know what you've got going on in your life, but the Bible is filled with stories of people that have made terrible mistakes and still gone on to do great things for God. I'll give you one quick story. There's a person in the Bible is very well known, King David. King David, boy, did he do amazing. Killed Goliath, avoided Saul, eventually promoted to become king of Israel, had everything that he could ever want, was a worshiper and a lover of God. But then what happened next? He wanted the one thing that he couldn't have, which was another man's wife. And then what happens? Well, he has an affair. And then to cover the affair up, he goes, oh, I'm going to make it look like, you know, the, that the husband got his wife pregnant. So he arranges these circumstances and it didn't quite work out the way that David wanted it to work out. So he goes, well, I know what to do now. I'll just kill him. And so I don't know what you're struggling with, but it's got to be less than that. And uh, that's pretty bad, right? And, and so here is David, right, who's done all this stuff. Do you know that the Scriptures say, listen, listen, listen. After that, after that, it says, he... It's the man after God's heart. What? How could you say that he's the man after God's heart, even though he's made mistakes? Because even though you're after the heart of God, you may still make mistakes. Okay, not as bad as that one, hopefully. In Jesus' name, across this room right now, and anybody watching or listening, right? Hopefully you never make that mistake. But the point is, is that you can still be after God's heart and make a mistake. David's sin had consequences, sure. But at the end of the day, God was gracious to him. Why? Because David chose Yahweh. Because David was loyal to him. Because he came back to him and he said, he wrote a whole psalm about it. Create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit. I don't know how to do this, God. I, I am so sorry for what I've done. That's called repentance. God, I'm sorry for what I've done. I wish I never did it, but I definitely did it. And I, I know that there are some consequences, but God, could you, I, I can't create a clean heart. I can't create a clean conscience. God, would you come and do for me what I cannot do for myself? And God was gracious to him. Well, keep reading. What happens? You read the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings. You see a long line of kings that did what? That actually weren't loyal to Yahweh, that didn't love Him. And what happened to them? Well, they were exiled to Babylon. 
they were kicked out. Now what David did was shocking and was terrible. But what's the difference between him? Ah, it's that Yahweh was still his God. Yahweh was still his king. He came back to him and said, I've made a mistake. Create a new heart in me. And I'm going to try to do better next time. These other kings, they said, we don't want to serve him. We'll go our own way, worship our own gods. And they got kicked out. David, after making a mistake, is still the man of God or the man after God's heart. Here's the most important question you need to ask yourself today. Are you ready? it comes down to this. Do you actually love Him? Do you love Him? Do you actually love God? And if the answer is yes, hey, you're doing okay. I didn't ask you if you were perfect. I wouldn't ask anyone in that in the room today if they were perfect. We all know the answer. I would ask you, do you love Him? Because if you love Him, you are right on track. And I would say if you love Him, Of course you try to obey Him, but obeying Him still won't save you. It demonstrates your love because you're trying to obey Him, but it's not what secures your salvation. Paul the Apostle says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he answers his own question. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at the very next verse. He says in 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We are not condemned because we're perfect, but because He saved us. He loved us. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sins and mistakes. We accept that as grace into our life. And if you accept that that is what Jesus did for you, you watch how the grace of God begins to flow in your life. Why don't you stand to your feet? I'll tell you the truth right now. God loves you. He loved you when He found you, but He loves you too much to leave you the way that He found you. Why don't you close your eyes for just a moment. If you're in this room right now and you said, even as you were speaking, Pastor Ben, my conscience is guilty. You were talking and I felt it. I know there are things in my life that are not right. And I'm speaking right now to Christian people who love God but are struggling with the issue of slavery. We just call it addiction today. There's a cycle of something in your life. Could be gambling, could be something on your phone. That's why no one's allowed to have it. Could be anything. But if you're in this room right now and you're gonna be really honest and say, there's something in my life that's in the dark that I need to be transformed by the power of God. Why don't you raise your hand? I'm gonna pray that God releases you from that awesome hands, 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 hands. Are there more people? I'm gonna pray in just a moment, but if you if you wanna to respond to this, I'm gonna pray that God comes and sets you free right now. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray for everybody with a hand raised right now. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would come and set the captives free because your word says, he who's free in Christ is free indeed. And Father, I know that in a salvation sense, there is a sense of freedom because those sins, those sins will never condemn them because he who's free in Christ is free indeed. Sure, but Father, I pray that you would break every spiritual chain right now in their life. Everything that the enemy would be condemning them about right now. In Jesus' name, would you come and would you set them free? I pray, God, that they would walk out of this place transformed. I pray that they would know that they are in a relationship with you because of what you did and not because of what they've done. I pray in Jesus' name they would know that they are not what they have done. They are not their past, but they are adopted sons and daughters of the King Most High. They are loved, not rejected, but accepted by you. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would come and release them from the things that they're struggling with. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Keep your eyes closed for one minute. If you're here in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, today you're standing here and you know that you are not right with God. But today you say, I need to make a decision to get right with Him. I want to be forgiven for the wrong things that I've done. You may have said a prayer many uh, years ago, but you don't even know where... You don't even know where you stand with God right now. I'm going to give you an opportunity to step into the very presence of God, to be forgiven for every wrong thing you've ever done. And it begins with a simple prayer that acknowledges what He has done for you on the cross. I'm going to count to three. 
And when I get to three, if you know that's you, you shoot up your hand and say, that's me, would you pray for me? Number one, God loves you. Number two, He died on the cross for your sins. Number three, shoot up your hand and say, that's me, I need to give my life to Jesus. Awesome. Is there other people that wanna give their life to Jesus right now? If that's you, just shoot up your hand and say, that's me, and I'll see your hand. If you're watching online right now, you can do this right from where you are. If you've never given your life to Jesus, but today you wanna say, yes, go, that's me, shoot up your hand and I'll pray for you. Awesome. I'm just gonna give this a second longer. If you're here and you know in your heart of hearts do you need to get right with God, say, that's me, shoot up your hand. We're gonna pray together. Thank you, God. Well, come on, let's pray so that the people making that decision, they don't have to pray on their own. So just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you died on the cross for my sin. I receive you today as my Lord and Saviour. And I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life in Jesus' Name. And everyone gave God a shout of praise. Come on, how good is that? Amen. Awesome. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video today. Like, subscribe and share if you think this content will be helpful for you or others. If you did give your life to Jesus today, please let us know. We would love to walk that journey with you. You can check us out at brightchurch.com and we look forward to seeing you either in person at a service or online. We hope to see you soon.